27 on the first day of the week, and the disciples came together to break bread. In fact, corroborative evidence, folks, I don't know if you know this, if you read into the early second century, they're doing that every first day of the week. And that's interesting to me, that they were still carrying on what you find in the first century. And thus it is what we're to always do. There's one thing for certain. We may not know when Jesus was actually born. I'm almost positive it wasn't on December 25th because the shepherds didn't go out into the fields in winter. That was of course, during the spring and the summer months, fall. And winter there is winter here, basically. We're on the same latitude, and especially Texas, we'll be on the same latitude of, of Israel. So most likely that's not when he was born, but I'm almost certain that sometime between mid-March to mid-April is the Passover. All right? So we know that he, that he was resurrected sometime during the time when what the world calls Easter generally falls. But we know it's on the first day of the week. And why I'm preaching this lesson is uh, because we need to hear about the resurrection. Uh, maybe we only do it once a year. We probably ought to do it more often than that. It's a cornerstone of Christianity. It's why it sets every other religion apart. I'll never forget studying with uh, a lady that married a girl, guy that worked at Boeing, and she was from communist China. Her, her parents were mid-party level Communist Party members. And uh, when I got to the resurrection with her and we talked about the fact that I believe the man had come back to the tomb, I'll never forget how shocked she was. She had only heard about Jesus. Can you imagine encountering somebody that they've only heard his name? But that's all she knew about him. And when I began to present to her the evidence for his resurrection, she was just astounded that anybody believed in his resurrection. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Every last one of us in this room are going to die. If time goes on and God's son does not return, every last one of us in this room are going to die. That's just a foregone conclusion. Benjamin Franklin said there are only two things certain in life, death and taxes. And, and we're all going to die. But I don't want to die. You don't want to die. There's something built in us that want to go on forever. And that part of us is made in the image of God. Jesus made that possible. He's the only one. Muhammad can't help you. He's still in his tomb. You know that's what they do every year at Mecca? They make that pilgrimage to Mecca. Buddha's in his uh, if the patriarchs are buried at the mosque that's over their, their supposed tomb in Hebron uh, to this day, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are still dead and all their wives. Moses is dead. There, there's no great religious figure that has ever claimed to come back from the tomb. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. And those that have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If this is life, in this life only we have hope, in Christ, we of all men most pitiable, the most miserable. Let us eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. If, if what I'm preaching this morning is not rock solid truth, then we might as well just, you know, eat, drink, be merry, and tomorrow we die. But if Jesus came back from the dead, and I believe with all my heart he did, and the evidence points us there, then that changes everything. And then we say it's a game changer. And it causes us all to, to pay attention to him. So let's think about the evidence together. First of all, did Jesus really die on the cross? You know that some present what is called the swoon theory. That is, that Jesus just fainted or he took a drug. Some people say he took a drug to uh, simulate his own death. Uh, that he revived in the tomb and then he came forth. Let's just begin with what the Bible tells us. In John 19, verse 1, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. The term scourge there is using an example of what's behind you on the board. This comes out of a book by C. Truman Davis called The Crucifixion of Jesus. And it's also in the, uh, a journal for American Medical Association. There were three doctors that back in 86 wrote a treatise on, on just the evidence for the death of Jesus. They would tie a man to a post and, and strip him naked. That's why I blocked out part of the picture. They would use a flagellum, which is that short instrument with on the end of leather thongs. There were sheep bone and lead of 
balls that were attached. Usually there were two lifters, and you can see looking at it from overhead here, one on either side, so that one would hit, and as he drug that across his back, the other would come down as he came up. And here's what he's described about that in that book by a medical doctor. At first, the heavy tongs cut through the skin only, then as the blows continued, they cut deeper into the sub cutaneous issues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels and the underlying muscles. Folks, I'm not going to make it any less horrible than it is. I'm going to read to you exactly what it said. And I want you to understand what happened to our Lord. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which are broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in long ribbons and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn and bleeding tissue. Eusebius, who was the bishop of Caesarea, was an eyewitness in the third century of the Romans doing this. He said the veins were laid bare and the very muscles and tendons and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. He witnessed the fact that you could actually see inside the body. There's, most people died there, folks, or a lot of people died before they were ever crucified. You remember Mel Gibson's graphic display of that? I can't, I can't hardly watch that. I make myself watch it just to think about what Jesus endured for me and for you. And then the text says to us he was crucified. What, what did they do? The, the slow, suffocating death of the cross. You know where we get our word excruciating? You ever say I have an excruciating head of headache? That word was the Latin out of the cross. Out of the cross. Five to seven inch spikes were nailed into his wrist and his ankles. When one tries to breathe on the cross, well, let me describe this in a picture for you before we get to how he breathes. When, when a Jew was taken, what, what was died, for instance, remember they wrapped up Lazarus' body in a tomb and did the same with Jesus. They would let the body decompose and they would go back in a much later date and collect the bones and put them in a little box called an ossuary. And then they would take that box and put it back further in the tomb with the rest of the family's remains. When, when a man was crucified in the first century, we only knew his name as Johannan, there were found in the bones of that box this picture of a spike going through his ankle bone. When they tried to pull it out, he obviously had been crucified. It caught in the end, as you can see, there was a vent in it. And it caught the wood, and they couldn't, they couldn't bring it out entirely. So they brought all of it. And it's a grisly reminder of what the Romans did. This is a recreation of how his ankle would have been nailed to the, to the, to the cross. Can you imagine having that done to you? When someone tried to breathe on the cross, they could breathe by... Uh, just hanging there. You could take air in. But to exhale, you had to push yourself up. They were on a little pedestal. They sat on a little pedestal. Can you imagine pushing yourself up or pulling yourself up? That's why when the soldiers came by with the mallets to hasten their death, they smashed their legs so that they could not push themselves up. They had to pull themselves up. And your muscles here would wear out. And finally, you just suffocate to death. That's what they did to hasten the death. I think the implications of the swoon theory are ridiculous. And in fact, I want you to understand, no modern scholar uses that argument. You'll hear it by the popular media, but no modern scholar on the liberal side of things even tries to use a swoon theory because it's so ridiculous. That somehow Jesus revived in the tomb, that he manages to escape and the linen claws undo them, that he manages somehow to roll away <clears throat> to roll away this stone. This is a picture of an ancient tomb in the first century. A very wealthy person would have had this. You see the, the rolling stone that would have been rolled in place in front of that. Took a many men. That's why those women, when they run to the tomb, they, or, or come to the tomb to anoint the body, they said, who's going to roll the stone away for us? They knew three women didn't have the strength to move a massive stone like that. You can see why. It would take many men to roll that stone away and enter the tomb. Somehow Jesus appears to his, to his, to his disciples. You imagine what his body looked like? And, and somehow convincing them the swing theory kind of falls apart if somebody is really thinking. 
There are five categories of evidence that I want to look at with you today very quickly. Because there's only four possibilities about Jesus. And you can begin them all with L. He's either Lord because he really did come back from the tomb. Or, he, or his people that followed him are liars. He was a liar, they're liars. Or they're lunatics, they're crazy like a lot of religious kind of religious people we see. Or they created a legend. It didn't happen, but they made a legend. It's like it's like Harry Potter. It's like a, a fairy tale. And so there's only those possibilities, Lord, liar, lunatic, or legend. Many scholars today, their answer to it is legend, that a legend was created. And so let's think about that for a minute. Think about the years of the gap that would have to happen between the actual event occurring and a legend developing. You don't have enough time when we consider the documents that are behind the New Testament. Jesus dies somewhere from 30 to 33 AD. We know that. We know who is, uh, where Pontius Pilate ruled. We know uh, when he was procreator. We know dates. There, there's just too much certainty about the short span of time in which he died. Acts is written sometime in 60 or 62 AD. The three main figures of Christianity at that time, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, are executed sometime between 61 toward 67, 68 AD. All right, so Acts doesn't mention their deaths. There's nothing about Peter's death, nothing about James, the brother of the Lord. James, the apostle, was executed, the brother of John, but not James, the brother of Jesus that you meet, in especially the book of Galatians and others. Acts doesn't mention Nero's persecution. Acts doesn't mention Rome's war against the Jews and the destruction of the temple. That was fast coming in 70 AD. We know that the Gospels of Luke and Mark are written before Acts. In fact, Mark is probably the earliest one. What was read to you a minute ago was also written before Acts. And what we call this is the gap theory. That is, there's just not enough time to create a legend. Let me illustrate to you from our time. Y'all remember that the Germans during World War II managed to take New Orleans and they worked their way up the Mississippi as any, you remember Joshua did that, entering the land, dividing the south and the north and attacked the south first and then went to attack the Canaanites in the north. That is great military strategy. Divide it and attack the weakest side first and then attack the strongest side when you've conquered and, and, and coordinated all your efforts. Y'all remember that, right? See, there's still people alive. If, if I made that argument within 30 years, the documents of the New Testament are written within a 30-year time span from the death of Jesus to when they're written, declaring his resurrection. If 30 years from from the end of World War II is 1975 when I was in high school. Somebody's arguing the Germans invaded the United States. There would have been so many people alive at that point. There's still people alive who know that did not happen, who were alive in 1940-45. Fought in the war. They're still alive. They can tell you. That, that's ridiculous. There's just not enough time. Legend takes centuries to happen in the time of so I guess with the rest of it, you're without pictures. I'm sorry. <coughs> pictures are pretty good with this one. Mm -hmm. All right. The second thing that we need to think about is the unanimous vote by both the friend and the foe that the tomb is empty. That Jesus' body is missing. Caiaphas was high priest from A.D. 18 to 37 A.D. He's the one, remember, that accused Jesus of blasphemy and handed him over to Pilate. They found his family tomb in November of 1990. They had a nice picture of his son's ossuary box that was found with the inscription on it. Uh, I think his, his son's name was John. John, the son of Caiaphas, is inscribed on that box that I mentioned a moment ago that the bones of, of wealthy people were in. So Jesus' accuser his tomb, family tomb, is found, and yet nobody has ever found Jesus' tomb. 
no money has ever located any kind of, of thing that would prove to us that Jesus had a tomb. The testimony of the women. In Mark 16, verse 9 through 11, it says, When he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him that they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. You remember that they thought it was idle tales in the Luke account that was read to you. The reason for that is that Jewish women could not testify legally in court they and their testimony was deemed unworthy. Now, I'm sorry for ladies that that happened in history and a lot of other things that, are, that have been abuses of what will, will, should have never have happened. But that's just the way it was. But it adds to the credibility. If you're concocting a, a false story, why would you throw a monkey wrench in? Because if you're wanting people to believe something you know you're telling is a lie, I wouldn't tell you that women were the first witnesses, I think you ought to take that as an honor, that women were the first witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. They're the first ones to come back and tell the apostles who thought it was idle tales because a woman's testimony was worthless. Why would you do that unless you're telling the truth? And all of the other testimony will point to that. I know the enemy knew it was empty. You remember in Matthew 28, it says when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. Can you imagine that being the best argument in a courtroom? If we were in a courtroom and the other side came and said, uh, the soldiers are saying to us that while we were asleep, they, the disciples, came and stole his body. I'm not much of a, I don't have to be much of a lawyer or somebody sitting in the jury room to tear that one apart. If you were asleep, how do you know who stole the body? If you were totally asleep, you're assuming that's what happened. And what would happen to you if you were asleep? You wouldn't be here to testify because they would have put you to death. Remember what happened when Herod examined uh, the, the soldiers that made them why Peter escaped, when he had examined them, he commanded them to be put to death because that's what Romans and Herod did to soldiers that didn't carry out their duty. Do you know that Justin Martyr writes in 150 AD telling us the Jews were still telling that same story in 150 AD? From the time the documents are written in 60, they're still telling it almost a century later exactly the same way. Now the enemies know the tomb is empty. They're not denying that. Why is it empty? Becomes the question. In Acts 5 verse 27 when they had brought them, the Sanhedrin brought the, the apostles in, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine that Jesus had arisen from the dead. And intend to bring this man's blood on us. And Peter and the other apostles said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. There's a power of witnesses to these things. Well, the question becomes, nobody's denying the tomb's empty. They all know it's empty. But who are the suspects? Romans? Why would the Romans move the body? You remember they sealed the tomb? Do you know what that means? They took a rope. You remember that? You got to see that, the rolled stone. They took a rope on one end and sealed it with wax, stretched it across that rolled stone, <coughs> and implanted wax on the other end. Then took Pilate's signet ring, that's the idea of the signet, <clears throat> and impressed it into the wax. You know what that meant? This is government property. You ever, you ever drive up that fence? Always drive up to that fence. Maybe it's out there in alien territory in New Mexico. You drive up to that fence, and it says, unauthorized personnel, you know, and it tells you all the bad stuff that will happen to you. You ever, you ever think you're looking around and thinking, nobody would have it. 
I'm going to go over there. I'm going to go over there. Then there's that part of me thinking, I don't have time to spend five years of leaven work. What happened to you if you broke a roll of the seal? Same thing happened to a soldier that went to sleep on his duty. They killed him. You wouldn't even think about it. So I know the Romans are out. Jewish authorities, why do they want to move his body? They set the guard. They, they said, we, we're worried that his disciples will come and steal a body. They even go so far as to put guards at his tomb, which makes it even more improbable. Because your last people that are possible to steal the body are the disciples. And what do they have to gain by it? They're cowards at this point. <laughs> Huddled in a room, door shut for fear of the Jews, it says. And they are not even thinking about overcoming armed Roman soldiers whose whole business was to learn how to kill people. To learn how to kill people in combat. They were lethal weapons in that day. Chuck Colson, you remember that name? He was Richard Nixon's counsel in the Watergate years in the 70s. He wrote a book called Loving God. The chapter in that book is worth the price of the book. It's called Watergate and the Resurrection. You ever get a chance to buy it in a used bookstore and buy it? And read that chapter. Because if there was ever a guy that knew what it is to form a conspiracy, Chuck Colson knew. Chuck Colson knew they had broken the Watergate. He was giving the president, or you know, at least they, they are saying that, that Nixon knew. But at least the top people knew. And one by one, when John Dean broke, remember he's the first one, when he broke, the whole card, uh, house of cards collapsed. They did not maintain that conspiracy for two weeks until it fell apart. And then you remember if you lived in the 70s. I can still remember the senator and, a, uh, and all the you know stuff you watched on TV. And Chuck Colson writes in that book, our lives weren't in danger. We might go to prison, but nobody's threatening us with death. He writes later, is it, is it really likely that a deliberate cover-up, a plot to perpetuate a lie about the resurrection, could have survived the violent persecution of the apostles? You realize they all died horribly? It's told that Mark had tied ropes to each of his limbs, each hand, each leg, and then horses galloped in the opposite direction. You remember seeing some of that in the movie? I can remember a movie I saw one time. They didn't show the end. But you knew what was about to happen. A horrible thing that would happen. All of them died except John. Violent deaths. And they never denied what they were witnessing. Colson and the rest of them couldn't hold a conspiracy together for two weeks. The scrutiny of early church councils, the horrendous purge of the first century believers who were cast by the thousands to the lions for refusing to announce the lordship of Jesus. Take it from one who was inside the Watergate web looking out, who saw firsthand how vulnerable a cover-up is. Nothing less than a witness as awesome as the resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain that their dying whispers that Jesus is alive. And born. Eyewitnesses. How many of y'all have served on a jury? Am I raising your hand? How many of you have served on a jury? Well, not many of y'all. I'm not trying to be worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got to serve on a jury in a trial. Most time preachers are not picked. They either think we're too we're gonna be we're gonna hang them or let them go. <laughs> and I finally not only did I get served on a jury, but they picked me for them. And I don't know why. But one of them turned and said, Well, you know, why don't you be the foreman? 
So I got to do that. Well, it's an interesting process. And I'll tell you what you do is in that voir dire part where there's about, you know, to be a hundred of you in there and they, they're asking you questions. And this one guy, you know, sitting down to me, you know he doesn't want to serve on the jury. He said, no, he said, I, I'd hang him. I hang him in a minute. <laughs> He's out. I mean, they, they don't want that guy on the jury. They're trying to find the people that can be the most honest, can fairly listen, because I guarantee you what they're going to ask you. Have you ever been on a jury? They ask you, say, do you know Mr. So-and-so? Do you have any connection? And somebody said, yes, I know his dad. I used to work for him. Said, You're out. <laughs> they don't want anybody knowing anybody. But they want you to be fair and honest, and you have no prejudices. They're going to ask you about all that. They're going to try to pick the best jury they can. And then what do you do? What do, you, do? You, you listen to facts. You listen to both sides do the best they can to prove from the thing that's happened their case. They try to shoot holes in the other side. They try to get you doubting. I remember when we went in, uh, there were there were there were nine of us on this particular jury case, and and or maybe there were twelve. I can't, I can't remember now. Anyway, the majority of us, I think there was twelve. Nine of us wanted wanted to, you know, put the hammer down, including me. But there were two. We had two, and they would not give up. The other side. So in the end, we didn't. Until it came out in the punishment phase that this guy had been drunk on a lot of other occasions running to people and then they felt really bad that we, we had to give him a lot lesser thing. But what am I trying to tell you? I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I didn't hear it. I didn't know anything about it. But I was willing to put the hammer down to that guy based on the testimony of other people. Because I had no right to deny the story they were telling. It turned out that we should have. That he had really, truly run into those kids and, and he was a doctor and he was drunker than a skunk. When you think about eyewitness testimony, Jesus' appearance over 40 days. What does Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians 15? And he appeared to over 500 brethren at once. Why don't you stop and think about something? You had in all the other guys, Peter and all the others that are mentioned, Mary Magdalene, all the others, about 515 people that saw the resurrected Jesus, at least that we know. What if you brought them into a court of law? And on Monday morning at 8 o'clock, we start the trial, and you get to every witness, 515, they get 15 minutes. To, to, to you get their side of testimony and then the other guy gets to cross-examine them. 15 minutes, that's it. We would start at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. We would have no break for lunch. There's no big break for supper. We're going to go 24 hours a day. You're going to get to Friday. Just do the math. And every last one of them are telling us, I saw him. I touched him. I heard him. He showed me the nail prints in his hand. He showed me the side where it had been thrust. When you get done hearing that testimony, all y'all are sitting in the jury. What's she going to say? I didn't see it. It sounds incredible. In fact, it sounds impossible. But if that many witnesses who are not crazy, they're not lunatics, they're not there in their right mind. They're telling me a story I didn't see with my own eyes. That's us, folks. We're listening to it. And we believe it because of the power of every day in this country, in the working days of the week. People's fates are determined. Life and death go to the, go to the gas chamber based on the testimony. Of other people. Our judicial system would fall apart if it were not for that. That's how powerful it is. Fourthly, think of the emergence of the church in history. Who were the first Christians? Jews. Jews were the first ones to be Christians, not Gentiles. That wouldn't come for another eight, nine, ten years to form any of us. Imagine during the political conservative days of the Reagan administration. 
that you left the country and let, just play along with me. You lost contact with the United States for the next 20 years after his term ended in 1989. And when you returned, you learned that a radical Marxist had been elected president after Reagan's last term in office when the, when the wall fell in, in bushes because of the, what Reagan did then I guarantee you a major question that's going to leap in your mind is what cataclysmic event happened between Reagan and a Marxist coming to power? Because Reagan was bent on destroying. You remember when he had Mikhail Gorbachev in the helicopter and they flew over Southern California and he wanted to show him how many houses had pools. That's why they flew he wanted to show them how many pools were in people. Because have you ever flown into a city and counted how many pools people had? What he was trying to tell Mikhail Gorbachev is we can have guns and butter. You can only have guns. We have the power to create both. And he wanted Mikhail Gorbachev to know you can't win this war. I want to know. How's a Marxist ruling our country? The Jews switch from the Sabbath to the first day of the week. Wait, what? You mean the Jews no longer are? I'm not saying that they're in their Jewish, in their Jewish um, traditions that they weren't still at times. For instance, you see Paul, right? That's a whole other story. Study in Acts. But he goes in the temple with some Christians and honors, you know, honors that cut that law of Moses. That, okay, there's a time period when Jews are switching. And I'm gonna tell you a switch that was instantaneous. Is and Paul participated, Paul, the Jew of Jews, on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to do what we did just a moment to break bread, Paul joined them. As all Jews did, who became Christians. And you want to ask what kind of cataclysmic event rips a hole in Judaism and moves the most holy day on the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week? Nothing short of the resurrection of Jesus himself. The fervor and the boldness of Jews, like Peter and John, who had been huddled up in that room now going into the temple and boldly proclaiming it to the point that they were beating them. Finally, they killed James, and then Stephen stoned to death, and then others died by the hordes. Finally, all of the apostles, violent deaths, because they had seen him. John writes these words, that which was from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. That, that folks, See is one thing. I see you. But remember how you looked at your wife when she was that beautiful girl that walked by? And wow, you were just smitten. You beheld her. You didn't just look and then look away. You beheld her. That's the point John is making for you. Saw him and beheld him. And our hands handled Reach into your finger, put them in the mail for him. Reach into your hand, put it into my side. Be not faithless, but be good. My Lord and my God, Thomas said. And the word of life, the life that was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, there's that crucial word, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us and which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Do you realize we're the only major religion in the world that sings? There's none that chant. Christianity is the only major world religion that sings. Why? Because our joy is full. And that's how you express it. 
The fifth line of defense is what comes outside the Bible. Gary Habermas, who's a leading authority in that area, has compiled 22 ancient sources that mention Jesus' death. You realize Josephus and others talked about that. Others among the Romans, Suetonius, mentioned this Christ that, that, that was crucified during Pilate's reign. They specifically, 11 of, or 13 of them, refer to the resurrection and 10 provide relevant facts. Let me tell you about one of them. You remember that the sun, the sky darkened at Jesus' death. You realize that happened everywhere the sun was seen that day. Half the world was at night, but the part that was in the day saw it. Thallus, a first century Greek historian who was not a Christian, wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world in AD 52, and he discussed the darkness that occurred during Pilate's reign. <laughs> His tactic was to try to explain it away as an eclipse of the sun, even though this could not be possible. Because we know that you can, you can historically go back, mathematically go back, and show where every eclipse would ever happen. Where every eclipse of the sun would happen. There was no way an eclipse happened during the time of the death of Jesus. And yet Thales mentioned the dark. He's not a Christian, but it just serves as corroborative evidence. All of you young people that are in the audience, I know what I do. I pray that my dying breath I hold on to. Because this is everything. All the other stuff that we talk about is important. But if this is not so, then the whole house of cards falls. But if Jesus came back from the dead, then everything is different. Your brother Hawkins, everything is different. We're going home. We're all going to die in this world. But we're going to a place where we will never die. And sin can have no hold of us if ever. And no sorrow and no pain. All because he came back from the tomb. Young people, I can't give you a faith. I can lead you. I can help to guide you. But in the end, you're going to have to make it yourself. Your own. You have to do your homework. You have to ask yourself the evidence that I presented today is it, is it enough to convince you? Convince many, many souls in time. They're not lunatics. And they didn't believe a legend. And they're not liars. It left them with one choice. Jesus is Lord this day. Alive forevermore. Who such the heavenly invitation? Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. He will help you this morning to become a Christian. All together, stand. Years I